This is the story of Clarence Brantley. Clarence was a janitor at a high school in East Texas. He was the only black janitor. This is a town where being black could be dangerous. His own grandfather was shot dead in front of a crowd of people. No one was ever arrested. After the civil rights movement, you might think that things have changed, but not there. White people would hang out signs warning the black people not to let the sun set on them there. On August 21st of 1980, 16-year-old Cheryl Ferguson disappeared. Her body was found raped and strangled. Clarence and another janitor, Henry Icky Peace, they found the body and reported it to the police. Henry was white, but they were both questioned. During their joint interrogation, Peace recounted, one of the officers told them, one of you is going to have to hang for this. And then turning to Brandley, he added, since you're the, you're going to be elected. Texas Ranger, Wesley Stiles. This killing caused such fear that the parents called him in. He wore a white Stetson and a silver badge hammered out of a Mexican five peso piece. He was over six feet tall and had a belly like a barrel and a voice as deep as hell. Ranger Stiles had been in Conroe for less than one day before he arrested Clarence Brandley and charged him with murder. This is a town where KKK rallies were still commonplace. Conroe in the 70s was, there was a lot of racism. Most people who had been in this town know that the first person they look for when it's a white woman and been, been murdered, they're going to get a black man quick. I was a high school custodian. School wasn't in, it was summertime. They were having a volleyball tournament. And just when we were getting ready to quit for that day, uh, one of the young ladies came up and they started asking, have we seen a, a Shell Ferguson? And we hadn't. And so we started going through floor to floor in the school, trying to see if we could find her. Icky Peace found her. She was in the loft. And he screamed out to me and I ran him to see what was going on. It was dim up there. You couldn't hardly see it, but you can tell it was a body there. And so I went downstairs and got the police, and the police came back up. They tried to make me look like I was the one that was guilty. I was taken to Houston and given a polygraph test by an examiner who had 16 years of experience. He told the officer who had transported me there that I had nothing to do with this crime. But nevertheless, they arrested me that following Friday. Normally when you're arrested, they take you under the garage, but they walk me across the street while all the media was taking pictures. It was almost like it was a show. I was taken into an interrogation room that lasted about five hours. They were trying to make me say I committed the crime, but I kept denying and said, man, I have nothing to do with this. Then they booked me into the jail. I felt like all hell had broke loose because I knew I had nothing to do with the crime. I cooperated fully, and I'm being used as a scapegoat. They started manipulating the evidence from the beginning. They had people come forward and testify and lie. They threw away the semen sample, threw away the blood sample. Now why would you throw that away in a, in a, in a, in a rape murder case? They did all of that because they didn't have no evidence against me. My trial was all white. When you said being judged by your peers, all white jurors, not my peers. They struck all the black jurors that was qualified. They didn't want no blacks on the jury. I was convicted. The judge, he just told me I was guilty and they hoped I'd be at peace and he hoped that God would bless me. That's all he said. Then he said execution date. They cut off all your hair, they shave your head, everything. They spray you like an animal, they give you a number, then they transport you out to death row. It's like going into hell. I always believed that one day that somebody, somewhere, was gonna look at the evidence and realize that I had nothing to do with the crime. I was on death row for 
approximately about five years going on six years before people started coming forward and, and telling the truth. The reason the Clarence's case was reopened was because of a woman named Brenda. She was a poor woman who lived in a shack with several children and a strong hatred for black people. She heard that Clarence was going to die and recalled a conversation with her ex-boyfriend James Dexter Robinson who had told her years before about the girl at the school. He confessed to her that he had done it. When police went after James, he took a lie detector test and eventually he said, I just don't know. I'm not sure. I guess I could have done it and forgotten. I just don't remember. The investigators then went and found janitors, the ones who had worked at the school that day. One, now an alcoholic named John, who lived alone in a tiny shack that smelled like urine, cried in shame as he confessed to the investigators what he'd saw. Cheryl was dragged into the bathroom by James and another janitor named Gary. When he tried to tell police this earlier, that Texas Ranger had threatened him. Henry, who we talked about earlier, was also threatened. He refused to say much in the new interviews, and when they questioned him, he would only answer by stomping his foot, once if they were right and twice if they were wrong. Other witnesses were beaten, run off the road, and threatened. One thing that nobody anticipated, though, when the people in the town had heard about what was happening to Clarence, and they heard that there were these witnesses, they had had enough. They came out of their homes, they gathered together, they organized, they marched up to the courthouse, chanting and demanding justice. They organized enough and made their voices heard, and soon a new trial was set. Coming forward and, and telling the truth. And it took another two years before I was finally released. As of today, I have never received any compensation. And matter of fact, when I first came home, they had me charged with $56,000 back child support. And still to this day, they still want me to pay back child support. And hopefully one day I will receive compensation. I'm hopeful for that. There's a lot of racism still alive and well today. Skin color. Nationality, minority, it still plays a part. And it all depends on what you have accused of and who you accuse of doing it to. Eventually, I think that's going to change, but it's, it hasn't changed so far.